Good day um, and welcome to our third CHURD webinar, webinar, which was entitled Leadership Post-COVID. But as we had a short discussion this morning, we decided that perhaps a more apropos title would be Leadership with COVID-19. I'm Kathleen Matheos from the Centre for Higher Education Research and Development. And I'd like to thank all of you and the presenters and moderator to take the time to attend. I realize you're all managing multiple priorities at this time. I'd like to begin by saying that we acknowledge the treaty lands and unceded territories on which many of us have the privilege of living and working. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Denny peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Before we move to the introductions, a quick overview of process and protocols. Please, if you haven't done so already, disable your video and audio functions for the duration of the webinar. One correction, the webinar will run for 75 minutes, over which time the panelists will respond to six questions. We recognize that you'll have questions and comments, and please put those in the chat as they come to your, your mind. And we will be addressing questions after the third question. We'll take some time and break for questions, which we will be curating from the meeting chat and subsequently after question six. We won't be using audio, but rather we'll be using the meeting chat for all your comments and questions, which we'll subsequently ask. The webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the CHURD website shortly, and we'll be sending you out some information about that. We'll also send you out a short feedback form and we'd really appreciate your input. Finally, I'd like to thank Tara DeCastro, Program Coordinator in Extended Education, for ongoing support for these webinars and really making these new initiatives take place for us. I'd now like to introduce you to the panelists and the moderator. Beginning with the panelists, Dr. Tom Chase, Interim President and Vice Chancellor, University of Regina. Dr. Adam Godry, Associate Dean, Research and Graduate Studies, Faculty of Native Studies, University of Alberta. Ms. Jonna Janiak, Vice Principal, Finance and Administration, Queen's University. Dr. George McLean, Vice President, Academic, University of New Brunswick. And Dr. Miles Turnbull, Vice Principal, Academic, Bishops University. And our moderator, Dr. Sheila Brown, who many of you will recognize as a long-term CHURN instructor and associate, President Emerita, Mount St. Vincent University, and a higher education consultant. So without further ado, Sheila, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Kathleen, and welcome again, everyone, to, uh, to our webinar. As we, we started to work through the topics that we might discuss, um, it, it struck the, the planning group that we really needed to shift our focus from the, the short-term measures that have been uh, required over the last three months and start to to, to turn our attention to the longer term strategic issues. And in that context, the article that's referred to in the material for the, the webinar, John Kroger's article in, in Inside Higher Education used a word which uh, seems to have become, have developed quite a currency. That is, how do we pivot from what we have been doing to where we go from here? So with that in mind, the the, we, will, we will, as Kathleen says, deal with three questions with uh, comments from our panelists, then an opportunity for you to pose questions via the chat room, and then a further three questions. So I'm going to start and talk and, and have our panelists talk, first of all, about the financial aftermath of COVID-19. We all know that it has been uh, a very, very significant impact, and that affects not only the present, but, uh, but the future. And so with that in mind, I'm going to ask Tom Chase to lead us off with um, his comments on, on the financial aftermath of COVID-19 and how we deal with the fallout. Tom? Thank you, Sheila, very much. And uh, hello, everyone. A uh, couple of comments on the financial aftermath. 
I think we all need to consider the following. Provincial governments are taking on tremendous amounts of debt. Uh, the federal government, of course, is taking on tremendous, tremendous amounts of debt. We have 44 million people out of work in the United States, our largest trading partner, and rising unemployment in Canada, together with business failures, uh, stressed sectors like the airlines and so on. It is not going to be a pretty time for operating funding for the next three to five years. One-time capital, a stimulus, a stimulus spending from governments can be expected. You might get some construction or some renewal on your campuses as governments seek to stimulate in the short term. But my message would be, in my opinion, uh, the likelihood of any increases, if not decreases, to operating budgets of universities and colleges is very small. I would hope that other jurisdictions would not see what Alberta is currently going through in draconian cuts to operating funding. So in our modeling now, going forward for the next two to three years, we are penciling in zeros on the grant and developing alternate scenarios for minus one, minus three, and minus five, if that should come about. In terms of uh, the other big stream of revenue into universities, student tuition and fees, I think everyone uh, knows uh, the concerns around international students at Regina, uh, they are about 20% of the student population, but because of the differential for undergraduates, they contribute 40% of our total tuition and fee revenue. And if that stream dries up, uh, we are going to have some major challenges. On the expenditure side, costs are not going down. We're saving a little bit on cooling, on water and so on. Effectively, we're taking all of those savings and putting them back into student assistance. Uh, we're, so we're not really saving any of that money. Our operating expenditures stay pretty steady. Most of them are salary and benefits. And to this point, and we in, intend to continue doing this, we have avoided layoffs. We do not want to lay anybody off and put them into an already overstrained public uh, relief or unemployment system. So the outlook fiscally for the next few years is, I won't say bleak, but it is challenging and uh, people like Donna and her colleagues on the financial and administrative side of all of our institutions are going to be called upon to work wonders to keep institutions fiscally sustainable uh, for the next two to three years. Thank you, Tom. That sounds like a good lead in to have Donna come on next and share her perspectives with us. Donna. Great. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and welcome everyone, thanks for joining us and I'm coming to you from, I'm honoured to come to you from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Haudenosaunee um, peoples. So um, I think if, if anyone missed, wasn't here um, at, the, at the webinar on Tuesday, I encourage you to look at, at what our colleague Adam um, had to say. On, on investment in EDII, you know, equity, diversity, um, inclusivity, and indigenization. Because I think that's one of the key um, principles I think we need to talk about. The fact that we have, we as institutions in these challenging financial times have to see, you know, understand what our priorities are and and stick by those. Um, Adam, in his response to a question on Tuesday, um, talked about the encouragement to keep um, investing in those key initiatives. And I do think that this is the time that every institution is going, because we're all facing financial challenges, is going to have to decide what are those key um, investments or key priorities that we have that we need to continue investing in. So I think that that is one of those principles that we all have to face now in these difficult times, you know, in addition to those that, that Tom has um, mentioned um, at Regina. I mean, that's great that you have not um, had to do any layoffs. Um, at Regina, you know, unfortunately, we have had to do some very, and I think I talked about it at the last time. It's it's all very temporary, and it's used, and it's right now mostly just in those revenue generating operations like athletics and so on. But but we have had to do some. So it's those decisions, and I think one of the principles that we um, 
have have talked about and and you know we don't know the financial impact yet so we're still preparing but is the fact that it's one university and so there are significant costs to in terms of all of the technology we're implementing for remote teaching and so on um, there's significant financial aid, additional costs. We had huge bursaries. Um, and we're saying we're all in this together. So, you know, regardless of whatever budget models we have, um, it is one university. And the same goes for um, those units that, depending on your budget model, may be hit harder by um, COVID-19 related, so some units may have lower enrollments than others in terms of the faculties and so on, and that's the same thing. So that really in terms of, Queen's uses a sort of a resource allocation budget model, you know, attribution based, RCM, there are all these different names for it, but um, we while that is the, the premise of, of how we do a budget allocation, this is the time to look at it does that work because we're all in this together um and and so that may not work in in these times of financial constraints and we and as leaders we have to decide what's really important and what are we going to continue to support and so i think that's that's sort of the key messages that we have in terms of the this um and the uncertainty. I mean, everyone wants answers. At Queen's, we're, we're very fortunate that, you know, it seems as though we've had a lot of uptake, but we don't know how much, how many people will actually show up, you know, in September. Um, well, not on campus, show up remotely in September. And so, you know, we, we have to plan in this vacuum and it's difficult. It's very difficult. Nobody, nobody likes that, mm -hmm. but that, but you have to keep in mind the long term, I think, and, and that we want to come out of this at the end. So that's, that's the, some of the principles behind. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. George, over to you. Thanks very much, Sheila. And it's a real pleasure today to be here uh, in Fredericton with all of you, at least virtually from uh, the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of Holistiquite. Um, so with regard to, to budgeting, um, several of my points will reflect those that, um, that Donna and, and, and Tom had made. Uh, the first order of business is assessing where your money's coming from and what it looks like. And right now we are fairly assured with our provincial government that our government grant is, is, is not going to go anywhere in terms of what it was slated to do this year to go up just slightly. Uh, down the road, there's some uncertainty, and so we continue to, to talk with the province weekly about where, where that might wind up. Obviously, tuition and, and fundraising, these are uncertain, um, but undoubtedly there's going to be a reduction. We had a, uh, an increase in our summer student uh, enrollment, which is great, but summer student enrollment is less than 10% of our overall student en enrollment from, from uh, tuition. So uh, it's not it's not a lot, but it is a little bit of a bump to get us through the, the summer the summer months. Um, really, what we've been reflecting on first are the are the are the first order matters. Um, trying to protect to the degree that we can our, our human resources uh, and looking at where cost reductions may be made in the short term, recognizing that we'll have a substantial deficit to deal with uh, in the fall. Although there's some uncertainty about what our student tuition will look like. Um, travel is, a, is, a, is an aspect of our, of our budget that we probably will be able to save a fair bit on. Uh, some physical space, uh, upkeep and maintenance on some buildings will be reduced because uh, it's not going to be a necessity in the fall term. Some service costs will go down, non-essential upkeep again, landscaping, things like that. Residences uh, will still un undoubtedly uh, lose something on residences moving into the next term, but we're trying to mitigate the degree to which that will happen. With, re with regard to protecting those that are going to be laid off, we've been looking at ways to ensure that contracts will be honored to be able to return individuals who perhaps are on furlough. Uh, to the best of our ability, reallocating work assignments for people who, uh, you know, especially in the, in the, in the sectors of our, of our mini city, uh, where there's the most vulnerability to try to provide a degree of supports and it may even be top-ups to things like CERV uh, to be able to provide um, some ongoing connection with, with, with our colleagues on those lines. 
Uh, and then finally, the comment that I would make is managing budgets with regard to our strategic planning. So um, a comment that I would make later in the afternoon might be that strategic planning um, during a period of pandemic crisis uh, is not an optimal uh, activity. Uh, they don't mix very well. Uh, tactical planning tends to be the, 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 the best planning. So we really have been putting a lot of our priorities aside. And with regard to most of our HR searches and so forth, we've been trying to set those aside just to maintain as much as we can a focus on where the budget limitations are going to look um, and letting people know, look, these are not removed forever. They may be in abeyance, but providing those constant assurances to especially deans that their budgets, whether they're carry forward aspects of their budgets or their appointment budgets may be held in abeyance for a period of time for us to be able to work through the next six to 12 months. Uh, and then after that, we would assess. But the last comment that I would make about this is that frankly, we would be acting irresponsibly if we weren't doing these things. If we simply plowed ahead as though all were normal, enrollments will look the same, income will look the same. Of course, everyone in our virtual room knows that. It just would not be a responsible thing to do. And quite frankly, I don't think we'd have the support from our colleagues if we went ahead with that assumption. They undoubtedly would be asking us, uh, asking us what we were thinking if we were budgeting as per a normal year. Thank you, George. Our speakers have talked about the uh, the challenges for the universities, but we know that the, the severe impact on students of, of this pandemic. So our next question is about the impact on students, both financially and personally, and what institutions can do to address these impacts. We know that um, I'm sure most, if not all, institutions are trying to ramp up their, their fundraising aspects. I'm sure each of you, like I, have been contacted by universities you might have attended, your current institution, to, to see if you're able to help in some of these circumstances. But um, certainly our speakers have alluded to, to the fact that um, student financial aid is a, is a big piece of, of budgets. And so that's where we'd like to focus our our attention for the next few minutes. And again, I'll turn to Donna to start us off. Thank you, Sheila. So yes, um, students were um, severely impacted immediately and, and because many of them, it was an abrupt stop, as we all know, to um, their terms. And, and so I know at Queen's, um, you know, even though students were coming with specific requests, you know, like computer access, internet, you know, those sorts of things, the way that we dealt with it was with, well, with a lot of compassion and, and generosity um, in terms of just emergency bursary. So we just created a large emergency bursary fund and it was all done through emergency bursaries. So, you know, even lost jobs many of our students had you know server jobs or so on that were immediately stopped and and um so we dealt with it and and i think by it was it started what march 16th and by the end of april we had already dispersed two million in emergency bursary funding to um both undergrad and grad students and i believe it's up to about three million now so it, it obviously slowed a little bit when the government put in place the um canada emergency student benefit the cesb so students had ac access to those funds that those that did not have jobs but um, it was significant. And I think that it's, it's compassion. We also did an immediate across the board for all international grad students who had um, applied for bursary assistance. We immediately just sent to all of them a $1,500, I mean, it's small, but $1,500 um, amount so to, to help emergency as part of this emergency bursary. So, the impacts are um, significant to students um, financially, and I think most of us have done what we can to support them. I mean, you know, the, the, these are um, budgets that we're going to have to recoup at some point, and and we'll, you know, per our previous qu um, uh, question, 
this was seen as important. We had to do this to support our students and we're going to have to just figure out how we fund this in the future. We have done the fundraising. Um, you know, everyone's, there's so many things now that I don't think the fundraising is as um, successful as you would initially think um, it might be. And then on the, so I think it's with compassion. On the personal side, um, I think my colleague Adam will be talking and so he will have more on that. But, but you know, I think like many of us, um, it's the mental health issues that we're hearing about that are the, are the huge issues on the personal side right now. And we're struggling with that and how, how do we help our students on that other than all of the, the resources that we currently have that are remote. We just instituted a, on Queen's campus um, opening up the res residence rooms that graduate students can go to during the day because many of them are having real issues in terms of whatever their circumstances are. So just so that they can have a place to go and work on their thesis and just, you know, some quiet and because the library is not open. Anyway, we're trying to find these things, but it, it is it is totally on mental health. And I think Adam probably can add a lot more to that. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> so Adam, over to you. Yeah, yeah, I, I think very much like like Donna said, it, the mental health challenges are going to be um, immense. And, and I think, um, you know, Miles said on Tuesday too that uh, a lot of students feel like, you know, they, they didn't go to their particular university to end up sitting at home, you know, on their computers and engaging with people remotely. But that's, I think, in a lot of ways, this is the circumstance, you know, we find ourselves in and the alternative, especially for large universities, is is going to be a real challenge. Like the U of A, uh, when things are functioning normally, has like between 40 and 50,000 people on campus on any given day, right? And so the, the likelihood of being able to return to that is very low. Um, and I think when classes resume in the fall, there's a very good chance that this is going to be a significant part of like a, the students daily structure, like how their days are structured is going to be very focused on um, their remote learning, the appointments they have, uh, say, you know, to meet as a group, to meet as a class. And I think a lot of socialization is actually going to be occurring through these classes, especially in spaces where you know there may be you know a second wave or you know a spike and people are staying home again that i think this is going to occupy a very important part of socialization for people um and is going to be in many ways like the first way to kind of um support student mental health is making sure that they have fulfilling social interactions in their courses again not ideal in a lot of ways but i think this is the situation we're finding ourselves in and and so I, we have a fairly small graduate program, so I, I, I've tried to speak with as many of those grad students as I can. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of them are craving that kind of regularized contact with people. They're trying to meet in their cohorts and they're trying to get together in smaller groups when they can outdoors. Um, but I think a lot of that, that loss of social contact, that loss of social interaction is like really kind of going to be, a, I think, a major issue on top of all the other challenges. And that these courses, I think, do provide a major role in kind of addressing some of that stuff as like the kind of frontline um, support for student mental health. Um, you know, for those of us that will be teaching in, under these conditions or have been teaching under these conditions, I think even stuff like group work can, in, you know, work to really support people and kind of make those connections, stuff where they might have to meet with people outside of class, I think is a really good way um, to kind of approach this. I think a lot of this is going to the challenge of universities is to help students structure their days in meaningful ways. Like I think a lot of us are feeling um, like the kind of normal daily structure of our lives has been kind of wiped away with this. Like there's no weekdays and weekends anymore. There's no not at work at work. It's just everything kind of blends together. And I think classes actually are going to have a pretty major and important role in structuring the daily life of um, students and, and instructors um, and the university as a whole. And so um, yeah, I think that's that's going to be an important thing is, is thinking about how we can help people structure um, their lives in ways that give them time to work, downtime and these sorts of things. Um, one of the particular challenges that I've been involved in kind of policy level discussions with at the U of A has been around supervision. Of course, graduate supervision is going to be particularly challenging. Um, those of us with 
graduate supervision experience know that when students move out of town, that can tend to slow down degrees, right? Because there's that less face-to-face -face contact. And now in many ways, that's that's just the situation with all graduate students, right? And so I think um, setting up ways that that students can have regularized interaction with professors, with their supervisors, with support people, I think is going to be very vital um, to kind of addressing those student mental health concerns just on like kind of a classroom uh, basis. Um, yeah, and and I think social interaction in, in this kind of dynamic is going to be a really important part of student success. Um, and it may not be the kind of most glamorous thing. It, it, you know, it's, it's going to have to, I think, go beyond grades and um, and kind of teaching deliverables and teaching outcomes and stuff like that to really focus on how we can kind of build meaningful structure in the lives of people who work at the university and people who attend the university. And I think uh, for better or for worse, courses are going to have a major role in supporting students. And I can talk a little bit more about where I think some of the accessibility concerns um, might arise later, but um, but I think, yeah, like I think this is a really important um, way in which we can support student mental health is just making sure that they feel like they're part of a community um, and that they're getting kind of meaningful social interaction um, through their courses um, because other kinds of social interaction may be curtailed, especially in the fall. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. On, uh, on Tuesday, we talked about what kinds of leadership and leadership styles um, were important in those first few months uh, from the mid mid middle March onwards. But as we pivot to contemplate a longer term future, equally important that we give some thought to, uh, to the exercise of leadership and leadership practices as leaders, we wrestle with issues like the social interaction, like how you manage um, a large emergency bursary fund where the money has to come from somewhere, how you deal with some of the financial aftermath that our speakers have been, been addressing. So the next question is going to focus on leadership. And while our speakers are addressing that, I'll encourage, uh, encourage you to send any questions or comments you might have to the chat room so that Kathleen can curate them and we can uh, address as many as possible in the uh, in the the shift to uh, dealing with your questions right after this next panelist led discussion. So with that in mind, uh, Miles, let me turn to you to ask you to start us off with the discussion of leadership practices. Thank you, Sheila, and welcome to everybody. I'm honored and privileged to be um, coming to you from Bishop's University on unceded territory of the Abenaki people in beautiful Lennoxville, Quebec, where indeed our local pub opened yesterday for the first time. And I can tell you that they were the our students have been coming back to Lennoxville in droves because they are seeking that human connection. And because I think many of them took advantage of the, the government's money um, that they were offering. And in fact, we've been having a hard time to hire students um, and to do things in the summer because they um, are making more money from the government than they normally do. Um, so that's just a little aside. Um, in terms of your response to the question, what is one I've been reading a fair bit lately on, um, inspired by our teaching and learning center about uh, a trauma-informed approach to both teaching and to leadership um, during the, the during and post to COVID times. And uh, I mean, a lot of the, the literature on, on leadership and teaching and learning for using a COVID type approach speaks about the importance of bringing people together, um, communicating frequently and clearly and transparently uh, involving uh, people in um, in coming up with the creative solutions to um, the challenges that we are facing now and what we're going to be facing into the future, um, to be modeling um, positive behavior, even though and understanding that some of the reactions and the whining and Tom referred to whining the other day, some of this is coming from a place of fear and uncertainty. Um, and uh, Tom talked uh, about compassion, and that's all part of this um, trauma-based approach. And a lot of it is common sense, and there's a lot of, but it's not always where the place we go when we too are 
struggling and and seeking um, creative solutions to very difficult challenges. And I agree with um, everyone that spoke earlier. We um, we may think it looks bleak now. Uh, we know that the financial realities coming down the pipe are going to be crazy, um, and um, we have to. We're going to have to make some very difficult decisions. Um, the other part, the other point I'll make, and then I'll, uh, I mean, I make two more points. One, I think we have to be keeping our eye on the end game, on the long term, uh, while at the same time pivoting in the short term. And secondly, and also from, a, I'd like, I believe it's very important that we communicate and espouse uh, an approach of shared pain. Um, that's from and that that language and, th and that may seem obvious and second nature to many, um, but I believe that we need to communicate and communicate it frequently that um, the administration of our of our institutions is going to be, need to be um, sharing the pain, if you will, um, going forward um, as we uh, battle uh, face these battles, these challenges. So Thank I'll, you, I'll leave it there. Thank you. George, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I think in many respects, the overall principles that we would employ in effective leadership during this time really are those that, that we, we, we ought to be considering uh, at the best of times. And um, I would begin with the notion of stewardship here, probably more than ever. Uh, stewardship as leadership, um, working with others, looking to improve a situation in, in ensuring that, that it's left in a better state than it was uh, when you found those, I think, maybe go without, without saying. But I guess in, 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 in short, I would, I would describe maybe four aspects of, of leadership that are particularly uh, salient during uh, a COVID period and, and, and living with a COVID-type uh, crisis. Uh, the first is collaborative leadership. Um, and this is, I think, recognizing that, that individuals themselves, although sometimes may be tasked to make decisions, need to be perhaps more so than ever asking the question, well, can I get back to you on that and who do I need to to, uh, to talk to? Uh, when I was at the University of Manitoba, a colleague of many of ours used to say, call before you dig, which is a phrase that many in Manitoba would recognize uh, because you don't want to go in your backyard and start chopping through a, a live gas line. Um, but it also really speaks to um, a different type of leadership that, that it requires us to collaborate and to consult and, and to uh, to, to get input. Uh, and that, that relates to my, my second point, which is the deliberative notion of leadership. And I think here it's really essential that leaders be seen as taking the right amount of time uh, and uh, making decisions with the right information at hand. Uh, right now, like many of your institutions, um, UNB is getting a lot of pressure to make decisions, not about the fall term, but rather about the winter term. And our own colleagues are saying, look, why don't you just pull the pin, make a decision? And there are things that could happen, obviously. Some significant uh, things could happen that would change where we are in decision making in mid-June if we were to wait until late September. Uh, and so there are solid reasons to be deliberative and taking the time and allowing, um, allowing for that time, I think, sends a positive message to colleagues that we're not acting impulsively. Um, thirdly, transparency in leadership. Again, maybe a concept that goes without saying, but again, more so than ever. Uh, the, the need to be shown, uh, to, to show that the, the decisions that are being made are, are being done in a way that people feel as though they're at least engaged, or they understand that they've had an opportunity to feed into that process in one way or another. And then finally, maybe most significantly for a period of crisis like this, decisiveness. Um, everyone has to have in a leadership position a strong stomach and the willingness to be able to say no or this isn't happening or that's not a priority right now or this is the decision. There's decisions that we'll make, there's decisions you'll make, and then there's decisions that I'll make in this particular context. Uh, and that notion of decisiveness, uh, ultimately, building on these other aspects of stewardship, collaboration, deliberation, and, and transparency, that notion of decisiveness, uh, I think, will be respected uh, and, and um, will, will be perhaps the most effective aspect in trying to get through the tactical decision making of leadership in the coming months. Thank you. Thank, thank you, George. And uh, it's interesting that, that you uh, 
that you list those those four items and and the fourth one was decisiveness because uh, we know that there's a the other the, the flip side of that coin is accountability and as leaders we we have accountability for the decisions that we we made and we can certainly be collaborative and and we certainly don't want to feel the that that we're being pressured to to reach a decision before it's been carefully thought through but at the end of the day decisiveness is important and i'll turn to tom for some final comments on this question before we we um go to 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 participant questions tom thank you sheila i don't have a great deal to add my my colleagues on the panel have been i think very complete and very eloquent i just ask everybody to think about this um we do need compassion miles touched on this there are going to be people who are suffering effectively post-traumatic stress coming out of this, whether it's the economic situation of their family, whether it's disease that's touched their families, whether it's businesses that again have collapsed. There are going to be people who are very fragile for a long period of time to, uh, to come, even once we're back, even when we have a reliable and widespread vaccine. I think that we're going to see a lot of kind of post-COVID, if you like, uh, stress, um, stress-related uh, illness, uh, mental illness, and so on. And I think this is an opportunity for us to rethink how these communities are, are structured. Um, there's been, particularly in the larger places, a uh, kind of move to an increased stratification where the uh, executive particularly is not really in touch with the people who are making the institution's work actually happen and sometimes not in sufficient touch with, with students and their, and their parents. This may be an opportunity for us to rethink and perhaps flatten our structures a little bit. And I'm really repeating what my colleagues have said in a slightly different way. I like George's notion of deliberation. Yeah, we, we, we do have to be decisive. We cannot uh, keep people waiting, but at the same time, we have to find a way to make sure that when we do make that strong decision, it's based on the best possible evidence and that we've really thought this through. And part of doing that, of course, is to consult, consult, consult. Not necessarily always through formal structures, though they have their place. But I, I'm trying to spend time now during the day just calling people, phoning people, uh, phoning members of the faculty, phoning alumni, phoning members of uh, you know, the, the community I know well and say, you know, we're thinking of this. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you see coming down the road for your aspect of the economy in 12 months? And how might that impact us? To reach out to people and make sure that they see that you are listening to them, I think is a large part of this. So I'd, I'd offer that. I think it's an opportunity to recalibrate uh, some of the way that we've built up, um, in some cases, a very hierarchical administrative structure. Um, <laughs> In some very big places, we say never in Canada, this is south of the border, of course, in the big state universities, an almost imperial uh, version of the presidency and the executive. And I think this crisis, that's what we're in, uh, provides us an opportunity to rethink how we, um, how we have built that, how we might dismantle parts of it, and how we may rethink the way that we relate to campus as a whole. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for reminding us that crises can present opportunities as well as, as we know, very many and significant challenges. We'll take a break from our um, panel-led question responses. I'm going to turn things back to Kathleen to, uh, to bring forward any questions or comments that you have asked. And in the interest of time, Kathleen, I think uh, we'll just have one respondent from the panel to each of the questions you might pose. Okay, um, a couple of um, questions that I just uh, wanted to uh, to to present, and they'll be quick. Tom, I noticed today that uh, there was an announcement that University of Regina has reduced uh, tuition fees by $188, and um, I just wondered if you could speak to that. Is that a provincial strategy, and do you in anticipate have you had feedback or can, can you just elaborate a little bit on that in regards uh, to improving the financial situation for students uh, thanks Kathleen first of all two words fake news we did not reduce tuition we were very clear and the media of course sometimes uh, don't get this quite right tuition has been frozen so we have frozen tuition which is effectively a saving of about four million dollars for our student body what we did do on the fee side was to waive 
or reduce or suspend a whole range of fees, such as the rec and athletic fee, various other things that for um, kind of the average student in arts or science amounts to about $188. But there is no tuition um, decrease. Uh, we had a petition of more than 4,000 signatures. Uh, we've addressed that. So we, we are unable to afford uh, a tuition decrease at this point because our costs are largely fixed. But on the fee side, we've tried to do what we can, and we've put uh, not quite as much as, as Queen's into student aid, but as much as we can into student aid. Thanks, okay. Tom. Thank you. And I'm just wondering about um, international uh, students, because that is a huge source of revenue. And I know Miles spoke about it, uh, about his international student cohort who had picked bishops for a very particular reason, not necessarily to study online. Do you see any reductions in the international component fees, et cetera? And I might just ask George in that case. I know you've got quite a, a contingent too. Sure, actually, um, it's interesting this came up because as a result of the announcement of, of the Regina today, we had, a, we had a conversation this morning at UNB about how we might be able to look at, at the, the international as well as the, the domestic fees. Um, there aren't any plans specifically um, to, to, to reduce or alter fees for uh, international students, um, but we are looking at uh, across the board where there may be services provided that uh, we are unable to, to, to offer, at least for the fall term. Um, tuition itself will remain. Um, there is a built-in to our tuition, uh, which was mandated by an agreement with our, with our province. Uh, and that came with some controversy, which we needed to respond to. Um, and given the fact that we worked through uh, a rather, rather delicate time with our student body on that slight increase to our tuition this year, notwithstanding uh, heading to largely alternative delivery methods, uh, we really do feel that this issue is one where we do need to make an adjustment. Um, I don't think we can be seen as coming forward with imposing or uh, uh, charging fees for services that we won't be able to offer, like you know, facilities or athletics. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, ball that I think Regina may have started rolling uh, down, the, uh, down the university path, and I think a number of us are going to be picking up on Okay, and I, there's one final question that just popped in. Um, how can leaders look after their own well-being and mental health when managing through this ongoing uncertainty and crisis? And I'd like to ask Donna for some input on that question. Well, I think, I think we all have to lead by example um, because it is so important. And so all of us are, I mean, I think most of those online, I think, have their days starting at 7.30 or 8 and going very long. Um, Adam talked about the fact that, you know, the, the week is, does, we don't seem to have weekends and, and our evenings, you know, we're no longer going home, we're home. And so our home is no longer the comfort place. So I think that we all, it's, we all have to um, make sure that we uh, as leaders um, encourage everyone that works for us to take the weekend off. Um, and and so that there truly are weekends, and, and and it's up to us to embody that that the importance of taking time for ourselves, and um, because it 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 definitely is taking a toll on everyone, and and we can see it when you know people get a little lose a little patience and get a little testy on in meetings or in emails and so on, and and I think it's because we are pushing ourselves and so absolutely um, I think as leaders we have to embody that work-life balance and and take time for our mental health encourage everyone to take time off and I know for sure this summer I mean I, I one of the things that we've done is is make sure that people take vacation time many people are you know some staff are saying well you know I'm, I can't go away I can no longer and, and we're saying, no, you have to take time off and take that mental, that complete mental break for vacation. So those are some of the things that, um, but it is tough when, you know, we're being, we're, there are so many day-to-day -day decisions and um, so many things on our plates that, um, but, but we as leaders have to do that. We have to embody that. 
Thank you very much, Donna. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Sheila. I seem to be having spotty internet, so I've turned off my video, but um, I hope people could hear me. So over to you, Sheila. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you to the participants for their comments and questions. We'll move on to our fourth panelist address question, which deals with what impact these unusual and unprecedented circumstances have had on the relationship between um, unions, uh, employee associations and, uh, and management, and how that might impact uh, future collective bargaining. I, I've been intrigued by the fact that collective bargaining has been continuing throughout the, these last several months using technologies like Microsoft Teams, um, but we also are seeing employee groups um, starting to position um, themselves in terms of what issues they feel have arisen. And I think that some of those are kind of flags for, for what might come up at bargaining tables in the future. So I'm going to turn to Tom first and then George to, uh, to just share some thoughts on, on this particular topic. Tom? Thanks, Sheila. Very quickly, um, I, from what I understand, from colleagues across uh, the country with whom I'm in touch and certainly here, um, people are being generally very reasonable and that includes faculty union leadership. We realize we're in a crisis, uh, we're in a pandemic. And in most cases, people are um, putting their shoulders to the wheel, getting the job done and abandoning some of the positionality that sometimes accompanies collective bargaining and preparations for collective bargaining. But as you say, going forward, I think that there are some things on the horizon that we all need to think through. Um, the rhetoric that we have seen on various campuses to the effect of hike wages, not tuition, simply not going to be possible um, in, in uh, the post-COVID era where government funding is going to be so stressed. How do we address that one issue? I'd say absolute transparency about the university's finances. You cannot put out enough information about the university's finances in the form of town halls and lots of PowerPoints and lots of graphs so that people understand if we want to increase the salary envelope this year by five million dollars and the grant is at zero that five million dollars is going to come out of the pockets of students or more students or the same body of students uh, paying more money uh, we need to be transparent we need to be convincing and we need to help students understand uh, how that's going to, to work um, on a more abstract level, not money level, working conditions. I think we're going to see, again, going back to the notion of fear, we're going to see faculty associations and unions say, we need better protections uh, for our members who may not feel confident about walking into a classroom, even after a vaccine is available. Um, going into a room with 15 or 20 or 30 people um, may not be something that they want to do. How do we accommodate legitimate concerns, legitimate fears, of people who are, um, you know, worried for their health and worried for the health of their of their families. Um, the final thing I would say at this point is that I do firmly believe that most people are reasonable, and that if we show that we are listening, if we are transparent with information, and if we consistently show compassion, we will be able to bargain effectively. And I, I hope that perhaps post COVID, some of that earlier. Position, positionality and uh, kind of bifurcation that we tend to see in negotiations will be lessened, will be mitigated, um, maybe even disappear in some cases. So I'll offer that. Thank you, Tom. George? Thanks. Um, the, the, our experience has been, I would say, on balance, uh, positive as well. Uh, we did two things right away when uh, we closed down the university for nothing but essential activities. The first was we engaged the faculty association and the other unions before we made any announcements. Um, frankly, I, th I think there might have been a little surprise that we had done that. Uh, we're talking to the president of the faculty association when he came into my office and we were all there, and we wanted his input. I think he was actually surprised at first that we had, we, we had asked to speak with him. But it was the right thing to do and it really smoothed the, the path forward. Uh, the second thing that we did, which I think was positively affected by that first decision, was that we approached the, uh, the faculty association to seek an extension of our current um, uh, collective agreement by one more year at the current in the current terms. 
And we were able to do that for both our part-timers and our full-timers. And that gave us the, I guess, the runway to be able to move ahead without the challenge of entering into collective bargaining, which we had just really started our pre-collective bargaining period. So the timing was good. There was real support from the, from the faculty association. Just set this aside and focus on the, uh, the priorities. And that allowed us to uh, respond, I, I think, uh, on a, in a more direct way with the faculty association and the other unions. Um, the faculty association asked for weekly meetings, which we've continued to um, uh, maintain. Every week we have a standing meeting. Sometimes it's uh, just a half an hour, sometimes it's longer than that. But we've really been able to work through a lot of issues. Some we've resolved, most I would say, and, and others maybe not, but at least we've had them discussed. Um, we have joint committees on, on issues and MOUs that are moving ahead really well, I would say, right now, because there's a little bit of time that people are finding, and we have these weekly check-ins to see where we are on that, and we're keeping both sides, the university and the faculty association, sort of keeping their feet to the fire on those joint committees. Um, we made decisions on assessment files for, for promotion and tenure, uh, had agreements with the other side about what we would do to put things on on, on sort of a, a, a pause for a year if, if, if faculty members wanted us to. Uh, we were able to address most issues with regard to faculty who were on sabbaticals, who found that their sabbaticals were abruptly ended or they were unable to, to continue with what they hoped to. And I think for the most part, we've been able to resolve that. Um, so those regular meetings, not just with the faculty association, but with our other unions on the campuses, have really been essential. I would simply echo what Tom said about about transparency, sharing positions in an active way, I think has been really very, very positive. Um, my final comment would be what's on the horizon. Um, it's, been, it's been positive. I think it, there's no reason to suspect it won't remain positive as we head through the summer and into the fall. But there are rumblings, of course. We continue to hear about, uh, you know, maybe this faculty's upset about a decision or perhaps we haven't taken a decision that, that, that people would, would necessarily favor. Um, it would be very easy to lose all of this goodwill uh, if we suddenly took a different approach and shut things down and said, no, nope, we're going to be nothing but decisive. Forget about the deliberative, collaborative and transparency aspect that I talked about before, just decisive. Uh, I think that would be the wrong approach. I don't think anyone here would suggest that would be the way, but it's more than that. It's about continuing to manage uh, and to nurture that relationship because I would like to think coming out of where we are now, we can put, we put in place um, a regular type of relationship that we want to encourage and maintain. Uh, and our faculty association has indicated that they would like to as well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a small uh, pay to, or a payment to make, I think, on a weekly basis for a bigger dividend down the road. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I think emerges quite clearly from what uh, my colleagues are saying is that this is uh, so much of this is about relationship building and what underlies relationships is trust and over this period of the last several months and going forward as uh, as groups of and individuals ha have come to realize that there is a foundation of trust that that will be a, a foundation that we can build on as we as we move forward uh, we have two more questions to cover and time is moving on, so I'm going to shift our attention to the, the issues that have arisen in terms of the shift to alternate or online delivery um, over the last while and how that can inform um, the programs and services that we offer moving forward. And I think I'm just going to ask Miles to respond to this one so that we have time in the last question for all our panelists to, to have a few final words. Um, so, so Miles, can I turn to you to, to respond to this question, please? I'll give it a go, Sheila. Um, so I'll just give what I, I mean, I, I'm, the last during the last webinar, I talked about um, the really stre steep um, learning curve it presented um, to bishops um, was this online and um, alternative alternative delivery mode. And um, I think we have to see we've all we've all been talking about identifying the silver lining within uh, um, this um, this experience. What are the opportunities? And I'll give one example. I think we're going to see the researchers say, saying to us that our, our young people are seeking, even those that choose a, an experience, a residential 
small residential community like Bishop's, um, research is saying that students would be open to and actually would benefit from um, a certain percentage of their their education being delivered in a remote way to allow them more flexibility, to allow them access to um, perhaps more flexibility for part-time employment, um, to accommodate their their lifestyle, their um, families, et cetera. Um, so I believe that um, we are going to have some instructors who are actually going to really enjoy uh, teaching in a remote way and actually some that are going to prefer to do that um, at least as part of their workload into the future. Um, we are preparing the infrastructure and the expertise uh, over time to do so. I've got one program um, that we developed that is actually quite not totally unique in the country, but it's, it's quite an interesting project, graduate certificate in knowledge mobilization. Um, and uh, there are not many, many of these kinds of programs around. Um, these instructors were insistent that the only way to do this was face to face in our small, intimate community. Um, it was postgraduate. We were marketing it only to Bishop's graduates. Not surprisingly, the numbers were tiny. This reality um, forcing us to be delivering this um, in a remote way tripled the enrollment for this spring. This cohort um, has, has tripled. And now these instructors see, actually, are now listening to what I said three years ago. I think we should be delivering this online only to expand and diversify our, 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 our market and our outreach. Um, so that's one example that I, I don't think that they'll go back. Um, to uh, in-person um, delivery mo mode for this particular program. And I think this will allow us potentially a diversification of our potential revenue sources into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Miles, and thank you for that reminder that there, there are opportunities that present themselves in, in this. Um, one of the things we spoke about on Tuesday was whether certain types of strategic initiatives had had to be shelved or delayed for the time being. And, uh, and then, uh, as, as Donna alluded to, Adam reminded us that the, there are certain um, initiatives that, that should not be shelved, that, that should not be considered um, luxuries, I think was the word Adam, Adam used. It's very important that we continue to commit ourselves to equity, diversity, inclusion, indigenization. And so in tackling this last question about what, what we've learned about strategic directions moving forward and how we might reintegrate some of the things that have had to be shelved, um, put on the back burner for the time being, how do we integrate into the strategic plans and how will all of this affect how our institutions look in the future? We've already had some insights from our panelists into that point, but I'm going to ask Adam to start us off on, on this one so that, uh, um, uh, that we, we have an opportunity to, to hear from all our panelists. And, uh, and uh, Adam, I'm gonna turn things over to you, please. Uh, yeah, so, um... Yeah, like I said uh, on, on Tuesday, yeah, I think that there's a lot of things that, that shouldn't be considered, you know, luxury or kind of fair weather policies, especially around EDI and indigenization. Like, I think these are really vital to the mission of the university. Um, but I've also been thinking a lot after one of my colleagues brought up in a meeting, um, how we're learning about remote education can also be a way to increase accessibility of university programs. And so, in Native Studies in particular, and I think in a lot of programs, there's a growing number of uh, students who are also parents, right? And and I've always had kind of a policy, like a lot of Native Studies uh, classes, like if childcare falls through, like bring your kids to class, it's not a huge issue. Um, but then there's also the, the challenge when, you know, say a child is sick and the parent who's also the student needs to be at home. Um, so this could be an opportunity where we could actually integrate some of this into our our kind of just everyday programming to to ensure that there's like equitable access to our courses in ways that um you know when when life happens that students can still participate in class and still kind of attend lectures even if they can't you know physically be there and so i think that there's also a lot of ways 
in which what we're learning now and the skills that are being developed you know, across the university can actually be mobilized to, again, kind of increase access to university education in ways that are, I think, beneficial to a lot of people. And, and I think that the days of like the traditional, you know, unencumbered, you know, late teens, early 20s student as the norm, I think those days are coming to an end if they haven't already, right? Um, a lot of my students are not in that situation. And I think that that is something that, you know, this is something we can think around to increase accessibility uh, for a lot of students, um, particularly women, who I think take still take on a majority of childcare, especially with young kids. Um, yeah, I also think though, there, there's I think a, a risk of overemphasizing online learning. I think one of the and the kind of opportunities it create. Um, I've also been working kind of uh, with immersive um, education as well. So land based learning, um, where you know we work with high school students in the north to kind of really engage um, with elders, traditional knowledge, and stuff like that. And so I think having these kinds of um, the, these, the, these opportunities to kind of engage people differently are really important. And so I think trying to find this balance between um, an increased online learning opportunities and all the opportunities that provides with also kind of reminding ourselves that I think our bread and butter is always going to be our ability to put people in, you know, in a room and have really interesting discussions about what we're learning. And I think that that um, is something moving forward that we can really think about. Um, obviously, I think the equity implications of all this are important. I think of that Alex Usher piece too that that said when we reopen our, our campus, you know, who's able to attend. Uh, it says a lot about, you know, who the priorities, what the priorities of the university are. And if we reopen before everybody can attend, um, maybe they have small kids at home that, that, you know, the schools aren't open or they may be, you know, caring for an older you know, parent or grandparent at the home and can't, you know, go to go to campus, right? And so I think um, there's a lot of ways in which I think equity still needs to factor into how we approach things and, and to make sure that, you know, you, university is is a space for, for everybody um, and that it's, you know, that that our, our pedagogical approach and our administrative approach is, is, you know, geared to maximizing access as well as um, maximizing a lot of other things like excellence and, and those sorts of things um, because I think yeah access and and excellence are often interrelated concepts anyway but yeah so I, I think we, we've we've had a tremendous opportunity to learn a lot over the past few months and we're probably going to learn a lot more before this is over um, but I think that these this can be put to the service of like kind of the broader mission of the university um, in really profound and interesting ways so yeah uh, thanks everybody for attending and uh, yeah, it's been it's been great having this conversation. Thank, thank you, Adam, and thank you for highlighting the importance of accessibility, which, as you and others have said, means different things to, to different people. It can be physical accessibility. It can be accessibility when you're juggling uh, various other uh, caring responsibilities. It can be accessibility in terms of whether you have adequate broadband service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we just have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask each of our other panelists if, if they'd like to add a very brief uh, final comment addressing this issue of how institutions might look different in the future because of what we've what we've learned. Uh, if you can just take a couple of minutes each, Donna, can I can I call on you next? Sure. Um, well, I think well, just just based on what we have said before in terms of compassion and trust, I'm hoping that that is is something that we've all learned and that we can move forward on. But one of the things that I think that in terms of the strategic direction that came out very clearly, and I think at all institutions across the country, was really the importance of the of the academy in terms of supporting our local communities and globally in terms of some of the research and, and but you know I think at at all of our institutions, faculty, staff, and students really came to together and contributed significantly to the to the local regionally as as well and i think that i have a feeling that that's going to become you know front and center of a lot of our um, strategic direction in the future because it is so important and it also provides an opportunity to talk to our provincial and local governments at least in ontario where 
you know, universities are seen as kind of ivory towers and not really there for the for the communities. And I think it provided an opportunity to show that we are. That is part of our mandate and that we are here. So that's that's all I have in terms of. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. George. Thanks very much. Um, I just I just want to say that I think Adam's comments were were not only um, uh, relevant, but they were kind of inspirational. Um, I, I, I love the tone that you took, Adam. Um, and so I, I don't want to repeat that. I think you did it in a much more articulate way than I could. But now I'm going to sound like the person who's just talking about the functional things that the university might do. But I just want to preface this by saying I really liked the, the inspirational thinking that you had about focusing on what priorities mean and focusing on people and focusing on what the institutions are really all about as higher institutions and places of higher learning. But let's, just let me add just a couple of comments, again, more functional ones that we might be thinking about in terms of how we could look differently. I, I think uh, the strategic planning exercises that we all get engaged in every few years, they really have to be flexible. Um, they need to be ones that are modular and that can move around when something like this happens. We can't be caught flat footed uh, with a plan that can't move ahead. Um, I think our priorities can and will continue to change. That's never become more evident than, than right right now. Uh, with regard to our learning learning modes, uh, blending learning, learning and uh, the way that we approach alternative delivery, as, as, um, as Miles reminded us, many of our faculty are looking at this and saying, hey, I'd like to be doing a little bit more than this. Our on online opportunities then can reflect all of that. Um, it's not just being online or in person. This approach can allow us to look at different modes of, of delivery that can integrate what we do really well and play on strengths of, of all of our colleagues. Um, there's so many opportunities with micro credentials and, and laddering and bridging programs now. Um, we just we have such an opportunity. It would be a shame to, to lose that. Uh, and the last thing that I would say is we also need to be really, really reflective on what our what our services look like on our campuses. Uh, we are in the midst of a residence renewal. And we've had to, uh, because of the, the situation, put the brakes on what that looks like, but it's also provided us an opportunity to look much more critically at what residences should look like in five years, as opposed to what we even assumed they would look like you know, half a year or, or, or a year ago. Um, so the, the way that we look at what our campuses do for our own students, our staff and our faculty, but also our communities, recognizing that we are in many respects and in many instances, many cities. Uh, and those those um, those those uh, entities as as a whole, those communities need to be really reflective of who makes use of them, not just uh, our own our own immediate uh, colleagues, but but all of those who, uh, who who make use of our of our campuses. So, and I also would like to end just by saying I know there may be a little bit of a time for an exchange, but I'm really glad to have been part of this, and, and I'd like to thank um, I'd like to thank your willingness to let me be be part of the discussion. Thanks, George. Miles, over to you. So I'm going to say two things. One, um, our temptation in the financial challenges is to um, freeze all hiring and renewal. I think that's a mistake. I believe that we should be um, investing strategically in a renewal of our human resources. That might mean finding creative ways to incentivize uh, let's say some succession in our in our faculty bodies, for example. So number one, so we have not frozen our tender stream hiring processes. We've we'll continued to, to proceed with um, hiring, um, but we've also had uh, a greater number of retirements. Um, secondly, um, I suspect that you all have some, some sacred cows in your institution um, and, ways of doing things that don't make a whole lot of sense, but they're touchy and prickly battles that you have perhaps pushed aside. There may be some opportunity in the crisis to um, catalyze some, some transformational change at this time, and it may be a, a positive time to have people think um, flexibly and creatively um, towards some change. And I, I look, I have a, a list that is, um, let's not say pages, but there are a few items that I we may strategically take the seize the seize the opportunity. Thank you very much. It's been a, I've learned a ton, and it's been a very enjoyable experience to 
to work with you all. Thank you, Miles. And Tom, over to you for the last word. Uh, just really, really quickly, as we make our way through this, um, it bears reminding that uh, universities collectively are among the oldest human institutions. Collectively, they have survived plagues, wars, famines, upheavals, reformations, revolutions, armed insurrections, and so on. And we as a sector will get through this because the work that universities do in the production and transmission of knowledge and formation of new generations is absolutely invaluable and irreplaceable. And I too want to thank you. It's been such a lot of fun to work with great colleagues uh, on, these, uh, on these webinars. Thank you very much from Treaty 4 territory here in Regina. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, it's, it's important to remind ourselves the points that several of our panelists have made that, that universities do not exist in a, in a vacuum. We are key institutions in, in civil society and society looks to us for leadership and to, uh, to drive forward social and economic and cultural agendas. And uh, that, that can be a heavy burden, but it can also be uh, a huge opportunity. So with that in mind, uh, Kathleen, I'm going to turn things back to you to, uh, to, uh, for any final comments or questions or, or whatever you want to, to introduce and some final words. Okay, well, um, I just wondered, can you hear me? Because I lost my yes. internet temporarily. Yes, Thank we you. can. Okay, first of all, um, we didn't have any further questions. And I think that in the discussion, I'm sure that many of you answered the kinds of things that were in our mind. But I really wanted to sort of thank everybody for being so willing to participate. This is the first time, you know, this series of webinars is something that uh, we've been wanting to do. But in, sen in a sense, uh, when we talked about sort of silver linings and clouds, this gave us an opportunity to try to do this. And in doing so, um, this gave us a chance to reach out to beyond sometimes our, our traditional market to do something that really focused on the Canadian institutions. You know, we've often heard a lot coming out of U.S. institutions. And, you know, while there's some similarities, there are some unique situations in Canada. And I think that's what we were able to talk about today. And I appreciated everybody bringing their perspectives and different perspectives and giving us an opportunity to learn together. So I don't have anything further to say as we go down to the um, 115 time. But um, again, just thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, moderator. And thank you for participants for taking the time to come today. And for your colleagues that weren't able to make it today, I hope you'll share the link for these two webinars when you receive them so that they can be shared more widely. So thank you. Stay thank you. well and stay safe all. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you.